Prevention is warning that this winter could be the, quote, most difficult time in our nation's public health history. The time for debating whether or not masks work or not is over. We clearly have scientific evidence. You couple that with uh, social distancing, hand washing, being smart about crowds, uh, doing things more outside than inside. Uh, these are critical uh, mitigation steps to which to many people seem simple and they don't really think it could have you know much of an impact. But the reality is they're very, very powerful tools. They have an enormous impact. And right now it is so important that we recommit ourselves to this mitigation as we now begin to turn the corner with the vaccine. But the reality is December and January and February are going to be rough times. I actually believe they're going to be the most difficult time in the public health history of this nation, uh, largely because of the stress that's going to put on our health care system. The U.S. has now confirmed more than 13.8 million cases since the pandemic began. New daily cases have skyrocketed to more than 180,000. And on Tuesday alone, more than 2,500 Americans died from the virus. That is the second highest daily death toll the country has seen. Hospitals nationwide are being pushed to the limit as they run out of space and sufficient staff. Meanwhile, the CDC has reduced its recommended quarantine window from 14 to a maximum of 10 days. The agency is also stressing the importance of not traveling this holiday season. All of this comes as the UK becomes the first country to approve Pfizer's coronavirus vaccine. And the US is not far behind. Adriana Diaz kicks off our coverage in Chicago. Hospitals are being hit by a tidal wave of new coronavirus cases with predictions of it getting worse. December and January and February are gonna be rough times. Daily coronavirus cases have continued to spike with more than 180,000 a day. That's nearly doubled in the last month. And the numbers are expected to rise now that it's been a week since Thanksgiving. And I think everyone's overwhelmed at this point. So this sudden rise uh, that you're seeing is very concerning. No, we're not flattening the curve at this point. In hard hit Tennessee, notary public Adrian Bowling has seen a surge in people desperate to get their affairs in order, people in ICUs. What is it like in the room when you're asking people in their hospital beds what, they, what their wishes are, what they want for their will? It is a very sobering time. You can tell from the look in their eyes, um, it's almost as if it's, becoming real that am I not going home? Is this going to be my final resting place? In California, average new cases and deaths have jumped more than 50% in just two weeks. In North Dakota and Rhode Island, 90% of ICUs are filled. Tonight, Stephen Hahn, the head of the FDA, is responding to whether the agency is under pressure to approve a vaccine after being summoned to the White House this week. This is what he told CBS News chief medical correspondent, Dr. John LaPook. Was there a pressure? being applied. This meeting was about understanding the process. What can you do to expedite the process? And we're always looking for ways to do that. We're also learning how many vaccines states could receive as early as December 15th. California is expected to get more than 300,000 doses. New York, 170,000, and Montana, 10,000. Allocations are based on population. But it's too late for so many. Like Guadalupe Lopez, a Chicago police dispatcher who received this tribute. The crying you hear are his children. My dad devoted 33 years of helping helping officers go home to their families. Their mother, Maria, has no idea her husband was given full honors after his death because she's in the ICU battling COVID. Hopefully mom comes home and we'll be, we'll be waiting for her with open arms. You know, that's all we want for Christmas is our mom to come home. Their mother is still fighting in the ICU. She's on a ventilator, but stable in the hospital behind me. Meanwhile, the CDC is telling Americans yet again not to travel for the holidays because of potential spread. They're still waiting to see what the impact will be from Thanksgiving gatherings. Elaine. All right, Adriana Diaz, thank you.
As we have been reporting, Britain has approved Pfizer's vaccine for emergency use. The move is raising questions about when U.S. regulators might follow. Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar says the U.K.'s decision should give Americans confidence in the vaccine. Charlie Daggett reports from London. Tonight, all eyes are on the UK as the country's health minister says help is on the way. Mass vaccinations start early next week. Regulators granted emergency approval saying the vaccine met strict standards of safety. Pfizer BioNTech's latest data was only submitted for approval 10 days ago. But regulators here have had a rolling review of the research, meaning they've been analyzing clinical trials since June. But, and this is a very important point indeed, that doesn't mean that any corners have been cut, none at all. Vaccines manufactured in Belgium are put into special freezer boxes that can carry up to 5,000 doses. By plane and truck, they're transported to the UK, to so-called NHS hospital hubs across the country, and then onto vaccination centers housed in sports stadiums and even race courses. The ultra-cold temperature requirements are not a problem, according to Pfizer's UK manager, Ben Osborne. Once it reaches the NHS and is ready for deployment, this vaccine can actually be stored in a normal refrigerator between 2 to 8 degrees for 5 days. Care home residents get it first, followed by people 80 and over and frontline health care workers, down to people 50 years of age and older. The rest will have to wait, but not for long. So how did the UK just leapfrog the US? Well, partly it comes down to timing. The FDA is scheduled to review this vaccine on December 10th. We're also told the FDA take a deeper dive into the raw data in these clinical trials. Elaine? Charlie Daggett, thank you. Dr. Eric Choi Pena joins me now. He is the Director of Global Health at Northwell Health. Uh, Dr. Choi Pena, thanks very much for being with us. As we just heard, the UK approved emergency use of Pfizer's vaccine. Does that give you more confidence in the vaccine's chances in the US? Absolutely, and thank you for having me. I do think it does uh, give me hope that the data that they're reviewing um, is positive data. Um, obviously, the FDA needs to go through its own process like the, the UK did, but I think this is a good sign. Well, the first doses will go to healthcare workers and nursing homes, and Dr. Anthony Fauci says it could take months before anyone younger than 18 gets the vaccine. Can you explain that? Why is that? So we're, we're obviously um, prioritizing those that are at greatest risk of having complications through COVID. And those are um, people that are medically frail and frontline healthcare workers. And those are rightfully the right choice for, um, for the first to be vaccinated. We want to make sure that we're, we're doing this in a smart way, utilizing the doses we have to do the most amount of good and protection. And kids under 18, by definition, are less at risk for this virus than, than the groups that I mentioned. Well, the CDC shortened its quarantine recommendation from 14 days to 7 to 10 days. Remind us, doctor, what prompted this change and could this shorter window potentially risk more infections? So it's absolutely a balance between um, quarantining to make sure that we're not spreading the infection and also allowing parts of our society um, to continue functioning. Um, and specifically essential workers, this is valuable. Uh, frontline healthcare workers, this is good guidance. And it's based on the data that most people that are exposed to COVID um, have uh, a median time of developing symptoms and having a positive test by about two to five days out. And it's a really tightly conserved median has been, has been presented by Dr. Fauci and others. Um, and so within the seven to 10 day window that the CDC is recommending, we're going to catch over 90% of COVID cases um, using that quarantine. And I think it's a smart balance between returning essential workers to the workforce and providing protection through quarantine. Well, the CDC is again warning people against traveling for the holidays. We saw millions ignore that advice during Thanksgiving. But doctor, how big of a risk is traveling? And what can Americans do to lessen the risk of exposure and transmission? 
Yeah, I mean, this is a huge risk, and and we're seeing the beginnings of surges um, from from travel in in Thanksgiving, and we're expecting, we're bracing for worse. Um, you know, the, the, the act of traveling uh, in and of itself is a risk factor. So it's not just about visiting family, um, you know, getting on uh, any type of public transport, whether it's a plane or a bus or a train, um, even in cars, if you're stopping at rest stations, you're, you're interacting across state lines and across multiple groups of people. And that in and of itself is going to fuel transmission. Um, I know it's difficult to do, but we really all need to get serious as we go into this period. Um, Doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers are literally pleading with the public to heed this warning because the system is full and we can't take much more. Yeah, nearly 100,000 Americans are currently hospitalized with coronavirus. To your point, hospitals are being overwhelmed. And besides Space Doctor, what other obstacles do healthcare workers face right now as they try to treat patients? I mean, the biggest obstacle right now is is actually the workforce. You know, I'm actually sitting in Staten Island right now in a field hospital that's been set up, and we set it up in a very short amount of time. Um, we have the equipment, we have the beds, we have the oxygen. Um, what we're missing, um, what is our rate limiting step in setting up this hospital, is the workforce getting skilled nurses, doctors. Um, this isn't the same as it was in March and April, where just one municipality uh, or area of the country is affected. The entire country is bracing and dealing with this right now. So um, there are no reinforcements that's that are running into the New York area um, because the rest of the country also has their own outbreaks. And so this is uh, this is a much more complicated problem than I think the public realizes. I think the public thinks that because we made it through March and April and through the summer, um, you know, we remember the outbreak was coming up in pockets. Right now we're seeing a, system, a nationwide surge, and that's going to put a lot of stress on our workforce. And I think that really is the pinch point in, in our COVID response. Yeah, that's something I think is so important for Americans to understand, because I remember at the uh, height of uh, the spring here in the tri-state area in New York, there were uh, traveling nurses, and you heard right. them talking about taking the knowledge that they learned in those early days of the pandemic back to their own communities. But as you point out, when you have these cases and these spikes and the surge all across the country, there is no one else to come in behind the already exhausted doctors and nurses such as yourself. Uh, well, doctor, as cases continue to surge, what is your biggest concern for the winter months ahead? I mean, my, my biggest concern really is capacity. Um, I think that um, as cases continue to surge, uh, we, we are going to have a, a serious crisis of, uh, of our workforce being able and, and healthy enough and rested enough to respond to this. Um, and this can be as prolonged or as short as the American public allows it to be. If we all wear masks, if we're all socially distant, um, and if we're washing our hands and limiting our exposure with other people, we really can still see these numbers plummet. This is not a foregone conclusion. This doesn't have to be a dark winter. Um, we just need to take the steps to prevent what um, many people, I think, are already viewing as inevitable. Dr. Eric Choi Pena, thank you for everything that you are doing, and thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me again.